America is a vast and layered country with so many worlds to explore. In this second season of our series, I journeyed across a landscape of stories from coast to coast. And now, we're going back. Back to New Mexico to revisit couples surviving the wounds of war. I'm like trapped in my own little world. Just nothing makes sense. To Georgia, where ex-cons are trying to survive outside of prison against tough odds. To Michigan, where identical brothers are facing every twin's worst fear. I'm probably gonna be lost without him. To Arizona, where polygamists are still fighting for understanding. We don't believe this is for everybody, but I know darn good well, it's for me. And to Iowa, where a parent has had a change of heart about how to raise her daughters. This is Our America, with its ongoing stories of survival, determination, hopes, and dreams. America, it can be inspiring and beautiful. It can also be dark and ugly. It's so many things but it's ours. It's our America. When we shot our story on extreme parenting, I visited several couples raising their children in radically different ways. They all wanted their kids to succeed, but each family had a different idea of how to go about it. The Pishoni family employed a disciplinary style of parenting a strictly regimented schedule of homework and activities. The Shermans favored unschooling. Kids choose what they want to learn when they want to learn it. And then there was Kelly and Jamison Smith, a couple raising their two daughters to compete in child pageants. When Natalie started her first pageant, she wore no hair pieces, no makeup, and I said I would never do it. I said, there's no way I'm going to become one of those crazy pageant moms. And so what changed? You have to do what you have to do to win. What started as a casual affair with child pageantry soon grew into a costly and competitive addiction for Kelly. I believe this dress ended up costing me like $400, everything said and done. 400 despite Natalie's growing dislike for the mini catwalk. So the last pageant she did, she had a massive tantrum. Massive. She doesn't want to do it, you can clearly tell. You see her drop to her knees, she oh, didn't want to do oh, it. Wow. And there she goes again, that kicking her feet, happy little girl. pulling out her hair piece. In spite of Natalie's meltdown, Kelly was still on the pageant track. She entered Natalie and one-year-old Annalise into a Kentucky pageant. There was only one catch. Her daughters were put in the same division and would now be pitted against each other. You're in a small pool of contestants. What mom wants their kids to compete against each other? I don't want to know which girl these people think is prettier because I think they're both beautiful. All right, ladies, if you please exit the stage. Now, step forward. And take the center X, please. Our divisional supreme winner from the zero to two, Natalie! After seeing one daughter's beauty rewarded over the other's bubbly personality, something in Kelly began to recognize the hollowness of her daughter's victory. I asked the judges, I'm like, why did Natalie beat Annalise when you could clearly tell that she was resistant to pageants? And the judges agreed with me. And they were like, well, it's kind of all about the face. So, I mean, if personality and, you know, life skills don't matter and it's just about a pretty face, what's the point of pageants? Despite feeling conflicted over the results of the Kentucky pageant, after it was over, Kelly wasn't quite ready to abandon the pageant spotlight. We weren't done when we walked out of that pageant. We had paid for a pageant in August, and we maybe said, well, are we gonna go? And I was asking Natalie, Natalie, do you wanna go to the pageant? And every time, no, no, pageants are ucky, no, owie pageant. And I was like, okay, she's done. She's telling me no over and over and over and over again. Give me that Natalie kisses. Oh. After ignoring Natalie's resistance to pageants, Kelly finally got the message. I 
knew a long time ago that I needed to let go, but I just couldn't. I wanted this. It wasn't me truly looking out for what Natalie, her best interest was. Kelly had spent over $10,000 on pageants since Natalie was born. Now she's decided to try and recoup some of the money she spent on glitzy dresses by auctioning them off on eBay. Jamie, do you want me to set a reserve for the Designs by Holly dress? The blue and green one. What did we pay for it? We paid six fifty or seven hundred. Um, do a reserve of five fifty. I'm gonna sell it. I'm gonna sell her pageant stuff and then just be pageant free. <laughs> it's the final act of letting go, one that Natalie is all too happy to take part in. You wanna keep it? No. You wanna put it in the box and make it go bye-bye? Yeah. Okay. No. You wanna do it? Yeah. Okay, tell your dress bye-bye. Say bye. Come on. Yeah, step on it. Life for Kelly's family is no longer about competition. It's now about discovery and nurturing new interests for her children. Um, you ready, buddy? Here we go. We're absolutely learning like who they are. I mean, it's just been really enlightening. We should have done it a lot sooner. But for Kelly, it's not just about fun and games. For me, it's very important to keep my kids involved because I think kids being involved is going to keep them out of trouble. If we ever did pageants again, it would be totally for a different reason. It would be for the kids, not for mom. My kids would be old enough to make their own decisions whether they want to do them or not. A startling statistic motivated our episode, Incarceration Generation. One in 12 African-American men have served time in prison, and in the coming years, that number is expected to grow. We followed several men on a path to redemption. I met Carl, an ex-con educator, trying to break the pattern of incarceration handed down from fathers to sons. There was Nicholas, a convict just getting out but with one foot already back in the prison system. And there was Royal, an ex-con doing his best to get a job and stay out of prison. You know, I can't go back. I know I can't do that again. It's life or death every day. To understand Royal's future, we had to look at his past. Once an honor roll student and drum major, he was locked up for carjacking at the age of 18. I wanted the cars, I wanted the clothes. I did what everybody was doing in my neighborhood. He got out at 24, only to go right back three years later to serve a decade behind bars. When we met him, Royal had been out for barely a month, a 36-year-old ex-con trying to find a job in Savannah, Georgia. He told me that with no work history and nobody giving him a chance, it seemed impossible to make it outside prison. People don't want to see your face no more. We just want to see what you look like on paper. And a guy like me don't look good on paper. Frustrated, Royal moved to Atlanta to reconnect with his family. They had only seen him a few times in 10 years. I found that the tough exterior Royal built to protect himself in prison was keeping those who loved him at bay. This is what I'm observing. It seems like it's like a hard shell, and I want you to open up more. That's why I said everybody has an opinion. We want to know how you think, how are you, because we don't know you. We don't know you. But those very survival instincts that had kept Royal alive in prison have also given him something he can turn to his advantage now that he's out a physical discipline he hopes to turn into a career as a personal trainer. It's like being down in this hole, and I'm going to try to jump as high as I can. I'm going to get out the hole. <laughs> you know, I don't know exactly where I land, but I'm going to get out of here. Good morning. How are everybody doing? Good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. This is a community effort to promote fitness in our community, all right? 
there are five components to physical fitness. Since we last saw him, Royal has been making great strides to get his business, called Royal Fitness, off the ground. He's now recognized by the International Sports Medicine Association. I'm officially a certified personal trainer now. Since then, I've been working on just marketing myself, getting Royal Fitness up as an actual entity instead of just a name I'm throwing out there. While we're doing these exercises, it's important that you breathe. I enjoy training. I enjoy working out. And being with people who are determined to better themselves, it motivates me to do a good job because I can't wait to see the end result. Royal has a vision, but without money, it's been difficult to promote his business. That's where Chandra, a marketing photographer he met at a local gym, comes in. Well, Royal and I decided to kind of barter services so that he could train me and I could in turn use my skills as a photographer, a graphic designer, you know, to get his logo out there, market him a little bit more. On this side, Royal, so I can see Jermaine's face. You want me to slide over a little bit? Yeah, that's good, right there. I know that when you come from that kind of environment, it's going to be difficult to let people know exactly what happened, what you did. And um, I think he's doing the right thing by letting people know, hey, this is me. This is what happened. This is how I created my future. And this is where I'm going with it. Good. I'm looking ahead. Putting one goal in front of me after another one is achieved. You know, one step at a time. That's how I live. I don't have time to be distracted by what's going on to the left or to the right of me or behind me. Royal's business is expanding every day. Two weeks after we filmed this update, Royal told us he's leasing his very own fitness studio space. It will take time to grow a large enough client base to cover rent, but Royal's on his way to making his vision a reality. In the meantime, he's focused on improving his relationship with his family. We have a better um, understanding and relationship with each other. You know, it improves with time, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm confident that things will get better. Happy birthday, man. I have been a leech in my past. I have just took, took, took. You know, it has been about me, and I never got it until recently when I started giving, started doing stuff. Being aware of myself, my family, my community, you know, it's what can I do for somebody else? And I like that feeling. <laughs> Royal seemed to be beating the odds by sheer determination and has been experiencing continued success. But unfortunately, Royal's story may be the exception and not the rule. We recently found out that Nicholas, another ex-con we followed out of prison, still hasn't found a job. I've been searching everywhere, you know, like fast foods, restaurants, tile shop, car washes, but I still haven't got a response yet, though. So without no job, you know, I really ain't got no goals set on what I'm gonna do. Nicholas is still waiting on a hearing for another charge, which could bring more prison time. No, I can't predict the future, but I hope the next move will be the best move, the best one I take. Coming up next, we revisit our episode on polygamists, one man married to multiple wives. You can't look at it from sharing your man aspect. You have to look at it like joining the family. In our show, Modern Polygamy, we visited one of the least understood religious groups in America, the fundamentalist Mormon community of Centennial Park. Within this community, I met two polygamous families in very different stages of growth. An older family struggling with the addition of a third wife, and a younger family that was squeezed into a small trailer on the outskirts of town. The patriarch of this modest home was 28-year-old Isaiah. He was married to both 28-year-old Marlene and 20-year-old Becca. Both wives seemed committed to living this lifestyle, despite the challenges of sharing their husband. Um, I think that there's absolutely jealousies to work through. I think it's a, a normal human emotion. You can't look at it from sharing your man aspect. You have to look at it like joining the family. 
They could have easily been the poster family for polygamy, undeniably happy and full of love for each other and their shared children. But the next family I met was quite a bit different, 17 people under one roof, and harmony was harder to find between these multiple wives. This was the home of Michael, who was married to three women, Rose, Connie, and Teresa. They have more than a dozen children. I'd always thought it was up to the man to wrangle as many brides as he pleased, but I learned that here in Centennial Park, it's the women that choose their husbands with the help of God. When I was a young girl, I was taught that we should ask the Lord to guide us to the person we had covenanted to marry. So though I may look around the community and the natural man in me may go, ooh, whoa, man, then the logical thinking part of me says, uh, if God wants it for you, that's fine. You're probably going to have to wait quite a while before that occurs. It's believed that men and women here are bonded in a spiritual pre-existence before coming to earth. They form what's called a covenance, a sort of divine contract. They're tasked with finding each other in the mortal world to marry and to raise a family. If they live the principles of their faith correctly, the rewards can be great. If we qualify, then those who live it will become gods and goddesses. And it's going to take an awful long time to do that. But if we work at it every day, we can accomplish it. And two for Papa. The first woman to choose Michael was Rose. Like Michael, she was raised in the principle of plural marriage. How many mothers did you have? Ten. How many siblings do you have? Sixty-seven. They were later joined by Michael's second wife, Connie. How were the dynamics with Rose initially? Initially, they were fine. After a while, they were strained because we were all learning how to live this way. Missing was Michael's third wife, Teresa. I learned that communication problems between her and the other wives had created a rift. Teresa had packed her bags and moved out. Of course, I want to say, why can't we just love each other and get along? But if she wants to move out, it's her choice. We were there five months later when Teresa decided to give the family a second shot. Um, I'm very nervous because I feel like that there were some feelings hurt when I moved out. Those feelings are going to be there until they're, they're done being there, and I don't, I don't have full confidence that they're actually done being there yet. Welcome home. Everything I saw in Centennial Park defied the stereotypes of polygamy. Women had a voice in their destinies, and at least here, weren't forced into illegal, underaged marriages. But the families I met here were not afraid to show me that plural marriages, like monogamous ones, can be difficult and come with their own set of unique challenges. When we returned to Centennial Park, we found Isaiah's family not only thriving, but enjoying the benefits of an upgrade. They're now living in a house with multiple bathrooms and bedrooms, rooms to expand the family. We were just living in a trailer. <laughs> it was just kind of small. Our family had grown, so this place is like twice the size, <laughs> at least. And Marlene has given birth to their fifth child. Our infants, they've been amazing. If one cries, the other one cries, you know, and it, sometimes it gets hectic. But I think uh, overall, our babies are really good. We're kind of excited to see them grow up together and see how close they'll be. And our hopes for the future for the family is whatever God wants. I don't really have any limits that I put on that. How many kids or how many wives or whatever comes, I'm okay with that. Yeah, and it's exciting, like, you know, and I'm ready. You know, just whenever. Say cheese. Cheese. 
Five months after our initial visit, Warren Jeffs, the most notorious polygamist in America, was once again in the public spotlight. He had finally been sentenced to life in prison for crimes of sexual assault. The public specter of Jeffs and the underage marriages he forced young girls into have long been a thorn in Centennial Park's side. His return to the spotlight inspired the community to redouble their efforts to step out from behind his shadow. They've decided it's time to take a stand and have opened their doors to State Child Protective Services for a seminar on abuse. The entire community came together, families united with children in tow. Sex abuse has to do with coercion, with power differentials. If you have to We would like the parents and the children that were here to understand the role of power in child development, the role of power in relationships, how that turns into abuse, why that line would be crossed, what can we do if we find ourselves in a place where we need help. Sexual exposure. This unprecedented gathering marked a proactive stance for Centennial Park to prevent abuse in their community something as important to them as working out the conflicts that can arise in a marriage with one husband and many wives. In Michael's home, Teresa's transition back to the family has been going smoothly. Running a household this large requires a team effort, and his three wives are finally learning to work together. Right now, I feel like my life is night to day difference from how it was a year ago. We're more willing to set aside emotion, even though we may be feeling it, and try to communicate objectively so that we can work problems out instead of just creating more of a conflict. You know, there was a lot of time where we stopped communicating at all, and then later I felt this too shall pass because it happens, but we would work through it. With the three of us working together and learning how to communicate and develop a system that works for three and it just gets better so that down the road, all of this is going more smoothly. While many couples might have thrown in the towel by now, for these wives, overcoming shared struggles and learning to grow is part of their faith. We believe that by the end of our lifetime here, our characters should be in a very good state. We believe that the only way that we can get to where we're supposed to be by the end of this lifetime is if we are presented with opportunities to grow. And the only real way that we're going to get all of the opportunities that we need to make all of that growth is by living together in this environment. It's our job to fulfill the covenants that we made with our Lord to have those experiences and try to learn from them. As soon as we learn the lesson from each experience, we can move on. How's the laundry schedule been working for you guys? I feel like it works for me and my work schedule. So how do you feel? Do you feel like it works for you okay? Yeah, to have two days to work between and not have to yeah, try to get it all done in one day. Yeah. I needed to be with the family. I needed my children to be raised with their siblings here in, in the home and they certainly needed to be with their father and with the other mothers so that they could be able to develop a relationship with each person. To commemorate Teresa's return and to chronicle their progress as a family, they've decided for the first time to have a group portrait taken. Okay, so um, we're gonna be angled just like this. Eddie, Rihanna, can you look right here? It's a joyful moment, and for Michael and all of his wives, a hard-earned one. I'm sure it appears easier than it really is. It's living la vida loca for the guy, right? Living the high life, three women, four women, however many women, right? Where the reality of not only providing for those women, but trying to meet their physical, emotional, spiritual need it's huge, it's a huge responsibility. Living with two wives or three or more, it's a whole lot of work, just like any one relationship is with a husband and a wife. But Teresa is here because she wants to be here. Rose is here because she wants to be here. Connie is here because she wants to be here. I'm here because I want to be here. 
And guess what? It gets easier. It gets easier. It gets easier. When we come back, we'll see how the veterans we met who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder have been coping. You don't have to let it limit your life. You gotta find a way to go about it. And we'll follow up with identical twins who've been facing a life-threatening illness. When we decided to do an episode about veterans and their families trying to adjust to life after combat, we began our journey at the Veterans Crisis Center, where responders take over 400 calls a day, sometimes from vets on the verge of suicide. What I hear you saying is that you want to kill yourself tonight, but what I'm asking you is, can I get help to you tonight? I learned that 18 soldiers commit suicide every day. Plagued by rage, anxiety, and irrational fears, the symptoms of PTSD. Do we have a real crisis on our hands? We don't have enough people to handle what's going what's to come down later on with all the people coming back. These soldiers were struggling to find solutions, and some were traveling as far as Angel Fire, New Mexico to a new age healing retreat for veterans and their loved ones suffering from PTSD. There, we met Peter Allered and Jim Stanick, two vets on a mission to heal themselves and their families. Peter was a medic who had returned from Iraq eight years ago. He had never shared with his wife, Andrea, what he went through, but it was clear it left deep scars. How's this like Ugly, ugly feeling inside. Like it feels like I'm rotted inside, and it feels like rage inside of me. He feels like he's broken, and he feels like me and the kids would be better off if he were dead. I come home. I got pills shoved down my throat. I got thrown into a barracks room, and was told to sit there, not to feel anything, be numb. Jim, like Peter, had served in Iraq. The war had filled him with anxiousness and anger. Even the military felt he was too hostile for combat. It takes a toll on the wives because we have to hold the world together for them while they crash to pieces. They're like ticking time bombs, and when they explode, you're just in that kill blast as a wife. I don't understand. I watched these couples encounter new ways to respond to conflict new ways of understanding how to live with each other. I've lost enough in my life. I can't afford to lose you. Thank you. Jim finally opened up to Lindsay, while Peter shared his demons for the first time. We started seeing uh, civilians. A lot of them had burnt, burnt kids. I just, I can't get on my head. We're gonna push everything out. It took the work of a Native American spiritual healer named Singing Bear to bring the man Andrea had married the rest of the way home. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> oh, I've been waiting for you a very long time. She loves you, Peter. For both couples, their time at Angel Fire felt like a new beginning and a chance to heal. But their stories also showed me that a glimmer of hope is just one step on a long journey home. Hey, babe. Yeah. The heavy one. Top's open. Thank you. Okay. And there's another Since right Angel there. Fire, it's been an experience of firsts for Jim and Lindsay. They moved into their first house together, and for the first time, Jim has his son from a previous marriage for the summer. What is that? Skull. That's Daddy's skull, right? Right. Yep. You could have the worst moment, and that kid will do something to make you laugh. And you have to stop for a second and really look at him and go, it's a good outlook on life. Jimmy, you wanna come see some of Daddy's uniforms? This one's heavy, bud. And he's off and running. 
When I got medically retired from the service, all my stuff was in boxes, duffel bags, plastic tough boxes, and I'm finally getting to the point now where it's time to let it go. It's time to go through it. Wow. You know what's funny? Daddy wouldn't even fit in these pants anymore. It's a long-awaited ritual, tearing off his military name tags and taking the transformative step of becoming a civilian. No, I think we're gonna save this pair. While Jim is proud okay, that he so fought for his country, for it's a fight that he hopes his son will never have to take part in. Can you put him in that pile? <sighs> My son's four. He doesn't need to know the reality of it at this point. But if he comes up and says, I'm ready, I'm gonna join the military, I'll be the first person to look at my son and tell him the reality of what he's about to get into. Yeah, jumping out of that helicopter or fast roping out of that helicopter, jumping out of that airplane, you're probably gonna have to take somebody else's life. Do I hope he never has to do it? You better believe it. I hope he never has to do it. I don't, I, I don't want my son to see what I've seen. I don't think there's any veteran out there that is dealing what we deal with wants to see their kids see that. Come here. But if it's something my son decides to do, he's got my support. High five? How about knuckles? What are we supposed to do, knuckles? Lock, Lock it, it and put the chain on it? <laughs> can we save that patch? Mm -hmm. We can save that patch. Wearing that uniform, you want to put that, one that was a part of my life. It's not my life. You roll it up and you put it in your pocket and we'll sew that on your stuff, okay? But while Jim is making okay. progress in some areas, the post-traumatic stress he has suffered this since the war remains. Now he's battling new symptoms. Jim was recently diagnosed with a form of PTSD epilepsy. He can be perfectly fine one minute and the next minute either can't stand up or he can barely can't talk. Get around, he can't talk, and so it's very out of my control. But at the same time, we don't let that affect our relationship or our quality of life. And along with the support he gets every day from Lindsay, Jim has discovered another way to ease his PTSD, and it comes on four legs. They're called service dogs. Give me a kiss. Jim calls his dog Sarge, and finds her presence calms him down. Being able to navigate it with a second set of eyes, somebody who knows when my insides are churning and my anxiety is going up, she's there for you. Yep. You know, a dog's unconditional love is just immense. So effective is this therapy, Jim and Lindsay have started their own program called Paws and Stripes to train more service dogs and connect them with other veterans suffering from PTSD. You don't have to let it limit your life. You gotta find a way to go about it. And if the service dog is the answer for you, then that's what we do. We're here and we will not rest until every single veteran out there that needs one gets one. While Jim and Lindsay have a new lease on life, Peter's healing has stalled. Despite the breakthroughs made at Angel Fire, soon after, Peter's symptoms returned, and once again, the Allerids found themselves back in the trenches. About a month ago, Peter became as depressed, if not more, uh, than he had been prior to the retreat. I guess I got my hopes up maybe a little too high, and I was really hit with reality, which is, it's still there, and it's still gonna be just as bad when it happens. I was having to just really come to terms with the fact that this is a lifelong process. I didn't realize how bad I was acting. It was like falling in a hole, you just don't, not knowing you fall in the hole <laughs> until, until you hit the bottom, I guess. With Peter's recovery wavering, they're reaching out to their network of friends and vets met at Angel Fire. That's it. A lot of Peter's PTSD revolved around, or his coping mechanism was to stay alone, to always be alone, and never go anywhere. I'm excited to see everybody. The singing bear's gonna be there. <laughs> hey, how you doing? 
doing? How are you, Mr. Sweetheart? How are you doing? I'm going to pick you up. What's up, man? Good to see you. <laughs> Simple things like him standing and talking to a couple of guys and not being angry and not tense and not on the verge of something awful is a huge, huge deal. And you brought your pooches. Yeah. yeah all right. Well, oh, this is my look sweetheart. who's here. <laughs> of all the bonds forged at Angel Fire, it's the camaraderie found with David Singing Bear that Peter turns to strengthen off, his man. wavering spirit. Singing Bear has taken him under his wing. Peter is now his apprentice, a spiritual healer in training. Peter's gonna smudge everyone, and then we'll. Do, I got tobacco for prayers. He's teaching me how to work with natural medicine and spiritual medicine. This way, uh, like natives have dealt with PTSD in the past. We always start with the breath of life. And then we do our prayers, whatever it is, you ask for a blessing upon your family, your grandma. It's healing for Peter's mind and soul, a new way to look at life. He hopes that by learning to use these old ways to save himself, he may in turn save others like Singing Bear has. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, huh? Yeah. You know you had a bowl here. Thank you anyway. You're awesome. I've realized that for returning vets, life will never be the same as it was before they became soldiers. It's always going to be an uphill struggle to find those moments of peace, those moments of normalcy. And the brakes work. <laughs> it's, I'm surprised that she's still with me after all this time. I know who he was before. I know, I remember that guy. I know he's in there. You know, sometimes he's buried a little deeper than other times. And sometimes he's right there for me to see, and I sure do enjoy those moments where, you know, I get to spend time with him, and I feel like we're in high school again. Today is a good day for the Allerids. But what about tomorrow and the next day? Peter may be coping with the symptoms of PTSD for the rest of his life. I make a choice. Every day, do I stay or do I walk out? And I'll be darned if for 10 years since Iraq, I've always made the same choice. I, I haven't found myself yet in the situation where I'm ready or able to turn my back. I tell myself all the time, I've been telling myself pretty much every day, the people that you'll die for, the people you need to live for. <laughs> Coming up, we'll visit Jim and Ed, identical twins navigating an uncertain future. We'll make it back to Twinsburg, even if I, he has to drag me. <laughs> Our story, Twin Lives, had us seeing double as we delved into the world of identical twins. These genetic duos account for just one of every 250 births in America, and they share a bond that's just as unique. We attended Twins Days in Twinsburg, Ohio, an annual gathering of bonded siblings. We met many different twins, but one story in particular moved us all, the joint struggles of Ed and Jim. For the past 28 years, these brothers have attended Twins Days without fail. Twinsburg is our weekend. One weekend to spend time together, to dress alike, you know, not feel out of place, and just have a good time. Even the years I've been sick, uh, we've made it out there, and we're gonna keep trying to make it every, every year, mm. as long as we can. Nine years ago, Jim was diagnosed with cancer, and the outlook was grim. They gave me three to five years, and I didn't know if I'd even live three years. While Jim was miraculously beating the odds, medications had altered his appearance. But on the inside, identical twins Jim and Ed were still exactly the same, and it offered the possibility of a cure. The doctor said, uh, do you have any siblings? And I said, yeah, I have a twin brother. And he was like, spare parts. Ed's stem cells mirrored Jim's. 
their unique genetic bond had given Jim a fighting chance. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, we're all set. Um, next, I hope to see you guys next year and have a safe uh, drive home. But Jim's struggle for remission was far from over. Twins Days has come and gone, and Jim is once again holding down the fort as Mr. Mom, managing the household and three kids. And Jim's identical brother, Ed, is as much a part of his brother's life as ever. Man, you got these small leaves. I forgot. Yeah, the, the, this yeah, tree here, I want to get it cut down. I want to try to help out as much as I can. They need help with something that's, you know, important and heavy or, you know, big job. Not a problem. I'll find, find the time. On the surface, it's life as usual, but Jim's health has been deteriorating. As it turns out, Ed's stem cells are too similar to Jim's and can no longer fight off his brother's cancer. For the first time in their lives, their sameness has worked against them. My myeloma has uh, returned, and um, according to the doctors, uh, they can't do any more transplants. And um, basically, there's nothing left they can do except try to keep me comfortable. He thinks that, you know, that, that, uh, that I could be gone tomorrow. I mean, you don't know. The doctor's prognosis has been a harsh wake-up call for the family. The reality that Jim's borrowed time is running out. We just told our kids, and um, they all took it a different way because of their ages. And my oldest son I've done a lot with, gone to a lot of scouting events, and uh, I think he took it the hardest. Yeah. It didn't really hit home that much. Then that night, at bowling, he um, fell down, had a problem getting up. Didn't hit me till I got home. It hit me hard, and I ended up having to take the next day off. Oh my gosh, I got mine all folded up. The medals are for most identical for your age group. We've won six golds, uh, six bronze, and two silvers over the past 28 years. 18. Struggling with cancer would be hard for any family, but for these twin brothers who've been inseparable since birth, imagining a life without the other is unthinkable. There's 84. There's the bronze. I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough to deal with, and I'm trying not to think about it until I have to. <laughs> you know, right now I'm just trying to stay strong and keep him strong and keep him going. Right now it's tough not looking alike because we've always looked alike and we've, I mean, we got medals to prove it. <laughs> Most people don't understand twins and, you know, they don't understand that, you the know, bond. the bond. It's like one soul, two bodies, you know, because we are always in sync. It's fun going and trying on clothes because we've always been the same size, so it's like, so it's kind of nice to have a twin because you can say, okay, you try this on. No, I don't like that. You, you Take that off. We'll get something else. So it's nice because you can see what you look like without looking into a mirror. These were ones that Mom put together. Despite the doctor's news, like Jim's philosophy year. remains the same. He'll fight for as much time as he has left. And like he's always been since the day they were born, Ed will be there for him. I'd rather be out doing what I like to do and taking care of my kids and taking care of my family and, and uh, <laughs> make sure everything's taken care of for them first. Um, I'm not gonna stop. I won't stop. And everybody thought we were gonna be the first sets of twins married at Twinsburg. It's Paul. We'll make it back to Twinsburg, even if I, he has to drag me. 
As long as he wants to keep going, I'm going to keep going, and we're going to start getting ready for next year. Yeah, even if I'm in a wheelchair, we'll go next year. I'll be there forever. <laughs> I'll be looking down on you and keeping you in line. <laughs> He's going to haunt me. <laughs> Finally, one of our most challenging episodes was 3 AM Girls, a look into the dark world of underage sex trafficking. When we left Andrea, an anti-trafficking advocate, she was still searching for Daisy, a minor who she believed was being sexually exploited. Less than a month after filming, she finally found her behind bars. After Andrea's tireless efforts, Daisy was released to a private treatment facility far away from her abusive past. Daisy's outlook is much brighter now. Over the past two years, I've traveled across America to explore its people and their stories. Along the way, I've been challenged by different points of view, and I've met men and women who've helped me see the world in new ways. I'm happy to say our journey will continue, and I hope you'll join me, Lisa Ling, for future episodes of Our America.